In a world full of distractions, there is one big question on every dog owner's lips. How do I become more than just the person holding the other end of the leash? We all get dogs with a dream in mind, a vision of the future. And if right now your everyday reality isn't quite that picture you had in mind, you are in the right place. It really doesn't have to be this way. You absolutely can and will be more to your dog than just the person who gets in between them and the world. The key is you need to be more sexy. More sexy than the neighbourhood cats. More sexy than the jogger in the park. More sexy than that half-eaten hamburger they just found on the floor. And yes, even more sexy than the dog across the road. I'm Tom. And I'm Lauren. Together Together we're we're Absolute Absolute Dogs. Dogs. And you're listening to the Sexier Than a Squirrel podcast. Hello and welcome to a special edition of the Sexier Than a Squirrel podcast, a podcast with a funny name that gets real life change, not just in dogs, but also in people. And I get to play your host. I'm Dan Tower Anderson. I get to play host today. We have a special guest who really doesn't need an introduction, Lauren Langman. She is Absolute Dogs, and I get to play a kind of a cool role in interview her. Uh, I know I've been a part of the Absolute Dogs community for a while, and I've kind of gotten to know Lauren through osmosis, through kind of watching stuff and kind of seeing stuff. So you kind of get to know, and you're probably like that as well, but this is kind of fun chance that we get to get to talk to Lauren, kind of sit down, have a coffee and, and talk to her. So Lauren, Welcome to your podcast. Thank you so much for for being here and allowing me to do this. This is fun. It is so much fun because I read through the questions and when um, they were sent through by my team and they said, Lauren, Tower's going to do a podcast if you're game on on you. And I was like, interesting. Okay, I'll read this. And I'm, I'm game. Let me see. And I read the questions and I was like, you know what, this will be so much fun. So I'm absolutely all in. It's lovely, lovely to be on the other side. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's start off with just kind of uh, a few kind of maybe more silly, just kind of goofy questions. Uh, What's your favorite color? I love color. So, you know what, I would say I'm more likely to tell you what I don't like. I don't like red particularly, but I love most colors. I love pink. I love turquoise. I love glittery and glitzy and sparkly on top of those um but yeah pink and turquoise I love yellow uh I like navy too weirdly I do really like navy so I have lots of favorite colors I think color is really important though for me you've probably seen it with the training center or my clothing or uh, my leggings or like everything is very very bright and colorful I I definitely love love color well even with the wall behind you big (laughs) splash of color back there I love it I, I love it this has a story. So this colour is, um, we, 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 we spent a long time picking this because it looks out onto grass behind us. It's obviously dark now because it's evening, but it looks out onto grass. And this is something that would go with that because something that would really make it stand out. And we looked at lots of different colours and my dad said, you need to try this one. And I was like, dad, I'm not having orange in my house. Like, seriously, out of here. No. Um, and he said, this is an orange, Lauren. This is Dutch orange. And I was like, okay, I still don't want orange, dad out of here I like, I like turquoise I like pinks I like blues and anyway this color just stuck like it literally got there and it was it stuck orange typically isn't one of my favorite colors whereas like I said pinks um turquoise uh, yellows but it looks cool I, I agree color is fun I like it I like it it's a good contrast I at least on video here, it looks good. And those listening, you're going to be like, what are they talking about? This is a good opportunity. Jump over to YouTube. Watch it on YouTube, youtube.com slash absolute dogs official. And you can check out the podcast and see us. And maybe you've never seen me, you've probably seen Lauren. You good chance to step me. over and watch. Absolutely. So favorite color. What about like uh, favorite food or favorite meal? Like if you were to sit down and be like, oh, this is birthday dinner what will what would be your favorite food or meal I love food I am an absolute foodie I am seriously foodie I love sweet food I'm savory food I love spicy food I love food like I'm absolutely easily indulgent when it comes to food I love chocolate I love cake I um alcohol would be interesting because I would never really pick um to drink I'm not like a big drinker um prosecco or something sparkly but 
I definitely food. I'm, I'm a real foodie. I love um, Parma ham. I love melon, grapes, cheeses. The British cheddars are fantastic. Like you get a good British cheddar. Um, that's a fantastic thing to have. Um, I love literally food. I'm, I, I don't think there's a lot of food I don't like. I, that's awesome. I'm much the same. People ask me that, often ask me that. It's like, it's easier, like you said, to, to name what I don't want to eat than what I do. It's like, yeah. Surpri- good food is good. Surprise me. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I think if I was looking at foods sensibly, like, of course, I, I get away with, like, sometimes trying to be on road services and, and find myself in McDonald's. And I try really hard not to. Like, I, I much prefer to eat well-sourced foods and, and foods that have been um, produced well. But at the same time, I'm just like everyone else out there that I will find myself eating junk food if I get an opportunity. Uh, I definitely, definitely, definitely have to uh, watch what I eat a little more than I used to. Like, I used to just get away with eating everything. And now I'm like, I can have blowout days, but I also try to uh, So I, I yeah include my vegetables and um if i'm gonna eat um I do eat meat so i'm not a vegetarian or a vegan i do eat meat uh and uh but again well sourced so we have local like organic butcher and and well sourced foods so that for me is is high-ish on my agenda i would say i try right on uh is lauren an introvert or an extrovert oh my <laughs> what a question <laughs> i we, we were somewhere earlier, actually, and then um, we got there and the, there was a person there and Matt wasn't expecting a person to, to be there. Matt's my partner. And um, I jumped out of the car and he said, you go and talk. I was like, come on, Matt, as if it would be any other. <laughs> like, I am all in. I love meeting. I love greeting. I've got no concerns about going up and talking to someone or um, sometimes saying difficult things and sometimes saying really fun things. Like, I've, I've got no problem either way. I, I'm, I'm absolutely extrovert. Uh, and I think I've always been pretty much that way i don't remember anything different that's awesome that's awesome that's fun um if you weren't doing what you're currently doing dog training what would you be doing i absolutely love being involved in my work with the police like i literally love it and i know it's not it's still dog training but it's different and i love being there i kind of when i'm there i'm like i can see myself this I could be out there doing like explosive searches and looking for like I don't know um like some something that's been put in Boris's bedroom which is what they were doing down at the, the sub summit or I could be like helping with um the funeral arrangements of the queen or whatever it is that they're doing because I mean they do some massive massive things and that was a huge event for um our late queen um a, a little while back and so they do amazing amazing stuff and I love I think it's the energy the buzz the fun the um seriousness of it the importance of it I think it's all a real bounce so I think ultimately tower I like energy and I'm drawn to where the energy's at and uh those things really excite me the other thing I would really love to do um in fact my friend said the other day you would be so suited. I, I, I'd have to find a message. It was funny. She was. She, she said, um, "I'll find that and I'll tell you." The, there, there's three things. <laughs> I love. I love to business consult, like to to consult with people on their business and to try and help them find uh, niches or nuances or um, things that they could be doing better, and um, things that they could maybe be tweaking or things that they are maybe not. Um, capitalizing on or uh, gaps and um opportunities I, I love looking at businesses like that and i love it doesn't matter what business it is um i love idea sharing and communicating ideas giving That's people cool. things that they might not have thought of L- i love doing that yeah. this one here really quickly, she said yeah. um she was talking about her work in the city and she said the city is its own crazy bubble or and it attracts such great people with loads of energy so much stamina grit it's always an amazing buzz if you ever gave up in the dog world you'd be very successful here they would absolutely love you um and uh basically the brokers here are, are really successful and you would fit in like super super well um, and and your work ethic would be would be right here is sometimes i feel like Oakhampton. i'm like come on we can do this better we can do this faster <laughs> Uh, it's before 11 o'clock and, and I can really feel that. So, like I get switchy and like busy and energetic and, no. and yeah. That's... Are you outside of dog sports? Are, 
do you play sports? Do you enjoy sports? Talking to high energy. I love sports myself. So you saying high energy, I think sport. I Are you a thing? I love um I really enjoy being on my bike. At school, I played hockey at sort of um county level. So I loved hockey. I was always a real like I, I love hockey, netball. Uh, I would say not so much these days. Like if I'm gonna do anything, it's with the dogs. Like I almost don't see the point in it if the dogs aren't involved. I'm like, hang on a second. Uh, but then I suppose the thing is, Tower, we were playing rounders the other day. We had a barbecue here for Devon Dogs and the students. And we were playing rounders in the big field. Bowlands is magical. It's beautiful. Like, it's a really beautiful space. And we were playing rounders and it was all cool. And then I still can't help but get competitive. I'm playing with 10-year-olds. And I'm still like, I'm going to win. Like, this team is the best. Like, I think that the there's a real competitive streak in me. And, and I realized it, you know, COVID was hard because I didn't realize how much I enjoy being competitive in my, my sport, which is agility. So agility really feeds my competitive nature. Um, and that competitive nature has its, has its needs met by, by playing agility because I get to play with the dogs and I get to um, be measured in some way. And I think that's, um, yeah, that's the sporty part for me. I think it's competitive. Yeah. yeah I, I'm, I'm competitive as well. So I totally get that, that you're playing with kids and all of a sudden it's like, no, he's still, he's still gotta win. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough balance. It's, it's if I'm into it, I'm into it. Yeah. I won't let you win, but I'm gonna win. <laughs> yeah, right, uh, yes, absolutely. I'm gonna be the best at letting you win. Yes. Cause I'm gonna win at letting, yeah, I, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I feel you, I feel you. Um, a question I get a lot for my clients, so I'm sure you get it a lot directly or indirectly. You and Tom, are you guys married? Are you a couple? What, what's the deal with you and Tom? This is the funniest thing. So someone Googled this the other day. Let me just search out. Oh, look. So, so if it says Lauren and Tom, let me just look. Because I want to see what comes. Uh, let's have a look um this is the funniest thing it came up with uh, so lauren and tom absolute dogs what are the first questions that came- <laughs> yes is there <laughs> so, so again this, this is she's question. showing a picture so you got to go to youtube are tom and tom mitchell and lauren langwin married that is number so one. there you go yes. so google even wants to know What's the deal, find, Lauren? I just find this really funny because yeah. honestly, that question, like, it makes me feel a bit like, no, like, dear Lord, <laughs> the relationship is wrong. Um, so, yeah. uh, Tom, I see like a, a brother uh, in the sense that like you, you kind of giggle, you laugh, and sometimes you poke him a bit. And other times he does that back and like you definitely we have a really fun relationship Um, we definitely uh, can both be really competitive. We can both be uh, really serious. We can both be really funny. We can definitely go head to head in the sense of I think this and I think that like we have a lot of fun. It's a really um, busy, energetic space to work in um, and to play in Absolute Dogs. The whole team are amazing. Uh, Tom and I met as I suppose he came he came with his his dog illy illy is an older poodle now and he came with her because he wanted to get her in a new environment and train here um, at the center and he was training and i just said oh my god this would be so much fun we need to put some camera he was pulled over by this massive um massive massive basset basically and he was literally pulled to the floor and i said this would be so much fun we have to put this on camera and so I suppose I see him like a kid brother in some ways like he's he's fun and energetic and we were on a camera earlier today, actually, and we were both dressed in the same sort of gear. And I looked at him and I'm like, it's like I'm sat next to my brother. Like, he is like my brother. And he actually isn't dissimilar to my brother. Um, so, yeah, uh, we've been really good friends for a long time. Both Tom and um, myself, we're both uh, engaged separately. So I'm engaged uh, to Matt and Tom's engaged to Madeline. And so uh, we both have um, relationships outside of Absolute Dogs. Uh, both of our partners are absolutely supportive and um, we're very, very lucky to be in, in great relationships all around, really. So, yeah, no, really fun. And we've known each other since we started Absolute Dogs. We really started pretty much three weeks after meeting. We were like really quick to start. I was like, this is amazing. We need to do it. I know we had the capacity to do it because 
uh, Matt and I had already sort of obviously we had the training center and um, we'd already done other things like um, a puppy DVD and and things like that so we kind of knew we could and I from there it's just history like really good friends uh, really great space to work in uh, we have an amazing training center where we have studio and um, podcast room and we're very very lucky that's awesome because it, it, the, the dynamic with you and Tom is 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 good I mean you guys get along well like you say it's like siblings it's like it's a fun dynamic so I think that's where people are like there's got to be more to no you're just <laughs> it's really good friends and you just a have a really good yeah there's a lot of energy there and I think there's quite, yeah. to a degree friendly rivalry as well I think we both sure. and Jocelyn and um give each other enough pushback we're both probably a lot to take on as in like both Tom and I are a lot of energy a lot of buzz a lot of bounce we're um feisty fairly like quick-witted I would say and to put us both in the same space together is a lot like it's 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 (laughs) two big extroverts and I think it worked really really well and I think that Matt balancing with us as well that for me really helps like he's He's fantastic. Cool. Whoa, you two, slow down. Like people are not getting what you're saying here. Or when we're working on things like Super Train and Matt will be in our ear and say, just recap you two, because you've just gone 20 steps ahead of everyone else. <laughs> Great to have it's a bit more. Good having that balance. So talking um, more family, you mentioned a brother. Do you have other actual siblings? Not just Tom, that's a fake sibling, but yeah, siblings, mom, dad, what's the... So What's the family dynamic? My little brother, his name is Lloyd, and um, he's a few years younger than me, so he's not really little. Uh, And um, he is, he's been a publisher, a writer, and he uh, was, during COVID, his his whole model changed. Um, Publishing kind of had a bit of a hit, I think. And he decided that he wanted a career change. So he's he's a school teacher. And he is very, very, very passionate about what he does. He's got two children. He lives in Brighton and mum and dad live at the farm uh, at Bowerland. And they also live in Plymouth. So um, my dad's had some ill health over the last year or two. So they kind of taken a bit of a step back uh, from living here. Uh, Here's a very busy place. Like here is amazing. (laughs) Bowerland is insanely beautiful, incredibly magical. It's an amazing centre. And it's a fantastic place to be. I think for my parents, there's a lot going on here. And so they've yeah. taken a step back. They've kind of almost given themselves a bit of a stop gap and a holding space where they can come here when they want to, but they can also retreat back to somewhere a little calmer because it is calm. But probably when you live here, it's a little bit busier behind the scenes. So I think there's a lot to juggle. Yeah, that's cool. That they, Yeah, that's nice. They have that place that they can get away from it because... Yeah, if you're in it, it's hard to get away from it. Because you live there on grounds yeah. in Barrowland that you you and Matt there, you're you're there. Yeah, so we so. have I mean it's it's an amazing place. And and so mum and dad initially, lots of people might have seen we bought it through relocation, relocation on television. So we bought it on national TV, channel four. You can watch the replay and go back over it. It was amazing, incredible experience. It's funny, isn't it? As you get any older you sort of look back and you go oh, I'd love to do all of that again but I kind of wouldn't because we've got so much here and the sense is amazing and we've got an amazing space but also it was so much fun it was like an incredible experience my mum and dad and myself all went in on buying a property for the training center we sold all of our, our mum and dad sold their house their lifelong sort of savings I sold my house which I didn't really have a lot of capital in to be honest I had some in it but not like enough to buy this place and between the three of us, we pulled together and we took out one massive mortgage and here we are. And uh, then over the years have worked really hard, have played reasonably hard, but have worked triply hard. And I think I am quite serious in the sense that I really want to work hard. Like I've always been a real work hard like person. And, and I think that's been a big deal being here. Like you, you do when you live on site. You work really hard because you rarely switch off it. So if I if we switch off, yeah. we do go away. We need to like leave the site because if not, the site is balanced, is beautiful, it's special, it's magical, and it's also full on energy. Like it's even now, I feel it. I'm like I'm buzzy and twitchy. Like it's a buzzy place. Yeah, because uh, right now you're not for those listening. You're not in the podcast studio. You're in your house. 
I'm in my house. So and- that being in the house, it's not like, oh, I'm in the house, I'm away. You're working right now. So yeah, it's... it's. And, and this, this is a room that's actually been built. So it's completely and utterly fully sound insulated. So I can be in here and the sound is really good. And also nobody else can hear me when I get really excited or bouncing or Matt's listening to <laughs> Like it's a really well insulated room. So yeah, it, you're right. You work so, in different spaces and, and people end up being in your house, which is weird because it means that everyone's kind of seen your house, which it isn't bad. It isn't good. It is like for me, it's a it's it's a way of life. And we've become very accustomed to it, and very used to it and enjoy it, actually. And at the same time, it's still good to have like I do like at nighttime we shut the gates. We've got a massive set of gates at the entrance I love those gates I press the button and I say good night <laughs> and then we've also just put some other gates in the entrance and they're largely for the dogs to be honest because when we let the dogs out in the evening um, they all get to be loose around here as long as their manners are correct they get to run around and the double gates are great because you've got two sets of gates and you can just say good night to people so, so you've mentioned Matt your fiance partner how did you meet him? How long ago? What, what was going on in your life? How did you guys meet? This is always a funny one, isn't it? When you say, well, I met Matt. I was I was his teacher. So I wasn't his <laughs> teacher. I was his dog trainer. So uh, Matt came, well, Matt's mum actually came for a lesson. And then Matt was having lessons. And I just remember, I was like, should we go to the beach for a walk? That'd be great. Let's take the dogs to the beach for a walk. And I suggested it to him. I was like, this would be a great thing to do. Um, and uh, I absolutely knew that I was like, no, he, he, Matt's a really cool guy. Like he's a genuine, cool, Matt's fun. Matt's really, really energetic in the sense that he likes sport. He likes games. He likes being involved in things, but he's not energetic on my level. Like he's not like bouncy ex- extrovert. He's introvert, but he's always up for whatever it is. And amazing supporter loves his dog agility but I would say he's much more into being a coach and a a groom and a supporter than doing it himself like he he did do it himself he lost his dog his dog um had a road traffic accident and was killed on the road about must have been about Mm. 10 years ago now and I don't think he ever got over that but um he is an amazing supporter an amazing groom um meeting Matt and like when you first meet, you don't know that you're going to be together forever. But now I know that that we're going to be together forever. Like that is how it is. And I am really eternally grateful for having such a rock in my life. I think that like potentially personalities like Tom and, and myself, we're so bouncy, we're so energetic, we're so like flitty fast. I think to have something stable is is really important. And Matt is really stability and and like really level level and kind and I think level and kind is so needed for me so yeah absolute role that's and, cool and, and and yeah when, when I met him yeah I was I was like not long after being a school teacher and Matt is a couple of years younger than me and I was like this is weird because he is a couple of years younger than me <laughs> like he was he was about I don't know 19 20 um and I was probably I don't know 22 he knows these things I am terrible I am not one of these women that knows when my when we got together or when our anniversary would be or how long we've been together I I can barely remember my own date of birth so literally no <laughs> however yeah Matt is he's, he's a very grounded guy that's cool so you met teaching so there's hope for me a single <laughs> guy that I need to get out and and teach some some classes there you just, you're saying there's hope I you, like that you're in a better place than me tower because I would say majority of the audience is women so I feel grateful very much so as a great man turn up on my doorstep for a lesson and I was like right That's... you are not leaving so there you go. now did you did you know to press a little further did you know when you first met him was there like a spark like whoa this guy is this guy's a looker. Holy cow. I think I, there was definitely a spark. And at the same time, yeah. I'll be honest, like he was young and he hadn't, I think he was, I think he was still just living with his mum, which I do think, and he will disagree here, but he's not here. So he can't, I do think <laughs> he to live um, a little alone first. Like, do you know how to do all these things? Like not to say that I, I just think it's good. Right. Like, so I think for, there's, there's a degree of them. Um, you need to be able to do all these things and I need you to be like grown up here. But other than that, I think, yeah, very quickly. Um, I, cool. 
I think the, being a little bit younger at first, but now it'd be the other way around. He's way more mature than I am. And he's way more responsible than I am. And even when I get in the car, like him or Liza would be like, seatbelt. And I'm like, oh God, yes, seatbelt. Like they're both like, really like safety conscious, reliable and steady. Whereas I'm like, let's do this. And like, let's run and let's dash. So you mentioned Liza, for those that don't know, maybe that's the first time they've heard that name. Who is Eliza? So Eliza is our 10-year-old daughter. Eliza is the light of our lives. She is absolutely uh, incredible in every way I can imagine. She is uh, beautiful, funny, um, enthusiastic, creative, uh, loves, loves, loves her dog training, loves her ponies. Uh, Eliza has um, a real affinity for horses and, and loves horses, and she's been lucky enough to on her 10th birthday, we decided she was she was old enough and ready to have a little pony for herself. Um, Eliza is definitely, definitely, definitely a, a good mix of us both, I would say. I don't think Eliza is an extrovert. I don't think she's an introvert. I think she's quite balanced. I think she has moments of being an extrovert and I think she has moments of being in, an introvert. She definitely, if you set her a challenge, like, let's go up to that bar and pay for this or go and order that one or run in the petrol station and buy that. Like she's not up for most of it. She's like, no, 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 someone will see me. So she's definitely not like, yeah, I'm going. Um, but she's also very willing to dance, jump around, sing and play in front of lots of people. So I think there are elements of, of extrovert there, but there are elements of introvert. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, talking kids, uh, kind of your youth, where did you grow up? You're in, uh, I'm in California, for those that don't know. I've never been over to Devon. So where is Devon? And did you grow up in Bowerland? Where, where was your youth? Yeah, so Devon is the most beautiful space in the UK. I'll be honest, if you ever come to the United Kingdom, for me, um, Devon is is heaven. I've only been to a few places I really think are quite as amazing and beautiful as Devon. I love Scotland. I love Wales. Um, I love Northern Ireland. I haven't been to, to anywhere else really um, in Ireland, but Northern Ireland I really love. Um, and they're all very similar, quite rural, quite, quite rugged, open, lots of space, lots of land, lots of fields, lots of opportunity in the sense of um, just beauty and openness, like gorgeous. We're right at the bottom, so we're very, very far bottom. We're very close to Cornwall, and I've only ever lived in Devon, so I have never left Devon. I lived in Plymouth. I grew up as a child in Plymouth city centre. My parents worked many jobs. I definitely have not lived like um, the luxury life as a child. We had um, very little, and we made do with what we had, and my parents were fantastic and always worked for everything so that we had everything, and and they, my dad was a carpenter and my mum worked admin jobs, pub jobs, um, shop jobs, um, financial jobs, like anything she could do to, to make ends meet and would always have multi jobs. My dad would work nights and shop fitting and um, then was in theatre for a while. Um, but yeah, I basically grew up in Plymouth, lived in the city centre all my life on the big, 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 big um sort of inner city, like tall townhouses, and then moved to Exeter University. My mum said when I moved to Exeter University, she said I'd be back. And as soon as I got a house with my dog, I didn't come back. I was done. I was like gone. She was like, you'll be back. You'll be back. No, she's gone. Whereas my brother came back loads. He was like constantly back. I was, as soon as I moved out with my dog, that was it. I was, I was there. And then I went to Exeter University. I studied uh, law. So I did a law degree. I absolutely loved university life in the sense of like the freedom and the novelty of it and I hated law I didn't want to learn law <laughs> the only bit I kind of liked was I liked the interrogation of like criminal law and the drama like there's a lot of drama and you'd be like bringing people up from the cells and interviewing them and that's quite like fun and drama but actually as a long term no it wasn't me definitely wasn't me yeah, yeah, I had similar kind of experience that I my background's in computers and um, IT and that sort of thing. And while the work itself was really fun, it I realized early on it's like this is this is not taking me a direction that I want to go. So when you realize law wasn't for you, what what did you do? Were you a dog trainer at the time? What was was the next step? 
think it was strategic because I kind of went, you know what? I know law isn't for me, but I don't think I could just jump straight in on dog training. And I love dog training already because I was training one of my dogs to do agility. And I'd only just started. I didn't know a lot about it. So this is like me at like 20. And I started just um, thinking 21. I started thinking, well, what could I do that would enhance this to make me stronger and, and grow and at the same time probably give me some income? And at the time, you were paid to learn to be a teacher. So you could be paid to learn and qualify. So I was like, hang on a second. And not like huge amounts of money. You're talking, I don't know, 5,000, 4,000, 6,000, like not for a year. So it's not like you're earning lots of money, but your qualification was paid for and you were given a bit of a living. So you were given, given a small amount of living, which was, was great, especially when you've been paying for your degree and degrees in, in learning here is not cheap. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to be a teacher. And I learned to be a teacher and I got my teaching qualification. It's a PGCE, so a postgrad certificate of, ex, uh, of education. And I loved the teaching, actually. And I loved working with children. I really enjoyed it. Like, I, re I found it very funny. Not like little children. I worked with, like, 11 to 18-year-olds. And you could have, like, jokes and you could make things funny to make them learn and you could make it so that they could connect with you and communicate in different ways like we made it a lot of fun we made it a load of fun like we we had a lot of good times and my students were amazing I really enjoyed it but I didn't really like the system and I didn't really like how constricted or restricted you were and didn't really enjoy the planning English lessons or I didn't really want to it's, it's not what I wanted to teach and yet I was teaching English law um, and a few other sort of topics at 11 to 18 year old sort of stage. And I just realized that as much as I like the teaching, I probably like the connection with the students more than I like the content of the teaching or what I was teaching. And I really didn't enjoy the, the, the system. I didn't enjoy the system. And I got out of that pretty quickly, like two years in, and I did not have a job. And I started my side hustle, which was, was dog training in the evenings and weekends just before really and I just kept running it and I just kept pushing and, and all of a sudden it went from me being a teacher to me being a full-blown professional dog trainer overnight and suddenly I had like clients and I mean it didn't build up like that quick but it built up pretty quick and um, it built pretty fast. I think you, you hit on something there that's really powerful that I think a lot of people gloss over as you're teaching you realize there were some things that you really liked but things you didn't like, were you able to take those things that you liked, the interactions of the people and all that, and it, I think I know the answer, and were you able to take that and just kind of filter that out and use that? Okay, this is what I like, this is what I don't like. I like dogs, can I combine the two? Was that intentional in your thought, I guess is the question, or is it like, I like dogs, I don't like teaching. So I'm yeah. going to do this. So I love the teaching. I love the dogs. I love the connection. And I still do. I love the connection. I love the teaching. I love the dogs. That's and cool. actually, weirdly, I would say, and this is, I had a brilliant coach, brilliant, brilliant coach about 12 years ago, maybe longer, 15 years ago. And he said to me, Lauren, and this was before I was, well, this was when I was kind of starting out. He said to me, Lauren, you need to be really thoughtful here because... Most people in dog training, they do it because they love dogs. He's like, I think you've got something really special. And he said, what I think you've got is something a lot of people don't have, especially not in dog training. He said, most people are not able to connect with people. They're able to connect with dogs. And the issue is, it doesn't really matter if you connect with a dog because it's the owner you need to connect with. And if you connect with the owner, yeah. you'll have a business. Yeah, there's people listening. There's so much profound that that's huge. Like, can you say that again, Lauren? Like that, I think people need to hear that. This is a dog training podcast, but repeat that. It's it's not just about dogs. It's and he he was he was called Michael actually. And Michael basically said, Lauren, the thing you have that loads of other people don't have. Because I was saying, should I be a dog trainer? Is this really like for me? And not because I didn't want to, but because I was qualified in law. So I had a law degree. And I'm kind of thinking, well, if I've got a law degree, how am I being a dog trainer? Like, this is, this is strange. And he said, the thing is, Lauren, you're brilliant at dog training. You've made world championships and you've done some fantastic things with your own. 
And the thing is, most people will fall into the trap of they do dog training because they love dogs. The thing is, the thing you really are good at that most people will not be is you need to connect with people. So to be a dog trainer, connection with people is probably more important than the dog training. Because if you can't connect with people, you'll never be able to train dogs. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That is, it's such a profound thing. Yes. Yes. As dog trainers, we are working with dogs by the name, but you miss a huge piece of it. Absolutely. That's, I love that, that it's, you dive into the people, the people is where the change really comes in. That's, that's awesome. So you went from law degree to teaching to dog training. What did uh, I guess Lauren Langman dog training look like in the early days. Was it Devon dogs? Did you go right from teaching to Devon dogs or what did that early days of Lauren Langman teaching look like? So, so my nan, um, I saw my nan a lot actually when I was, when I was younger and she, um, my dear nan, she passed away this year and she loved dogs. She was always passionate about dogs. She was passionate about dogs and she also had pigs. So she had, pigs when I was growing up she had a she had a pig farm and and so uh Nan loved what we did she loved the dog training she had rosettes on her wall even this year um when she passed away they were still up the rosettes she loved the dog she loved the dog training she would often look after my dogs I would often drop off a dog when I was going somewhere or pick up a dog when I was going somewhere else like she was brilliant with Poppy my naughty but nice dog she was just brilliant so Nan was Nan was great and she found a local field for me to rent. It was £10 a week down. So like £10 a week. <laughs> Insane. And it was on a hill like this. <laughs> neighbors. And so I would go there. I would train the dogs. Uh, I would be paid for lessons. And uh, initially, I, I, I don't remember when it became Devon Dogs, but I don't remember it not being Devon Dogs ever. So I only ever remember it being Devon Dogs. And we ran it Devon Dogs. And then... As it got successful, we ran a very small village hall. And then as that got successful, we hired a training building, like an arena. And then as that got successful, we hired two arenas. And then we hired two arenas in a field. And then we hired the whole center. And then we bought another center, which was Bowerlin. <laughs> then we ran the two centers for a while. And that went really, really well. I love doing that. And then they decided to sell the other center. And we had to kind of go... <gasps> okay, we're going to jump ship and we're going to go all at home. And I think that often happens with you as a dog trainer. I think your venues will change. I think venues are one of your big, your your big struggles are venues, planning and clientele. So Oakhampton is a very quiet area. Please, dear Lord, if you're ever in Oakhampton, come and train at Devon Dogs because Devon Dogs is a small space. It needs people to come to it. It's in a very rural, remote area. It's not actually that difficult to get to, but it's, we're right down in the bottom of Devon. So it, it does need traffic. Right. And it doesn't always have traffic because it's remote. And so um, I love it when we get people here. I think that's really, really valuable for learning, for keeping a brilliant energetic space going. I think it's important. And I love that we get to do in person. But equally, I think where it started was on a hill like that. So I think it, it should show people that whether you've got like a, a, a venue that's on a hill and absolutely not suitable for people to get to or anything, it's just terrible. Everything was terrible about the venue. Access, everything. <laughs> I had a field to train in. And then right through to the most amazing center that we had complete use of, and then building our own facility, which makes the other center look like just an absolute tip in comparison. Like, it, yeah, you can grow, you can grow. And when you first started off on the, the field like that was it were you doing one-to-ones were you doing group was it a combination I could only do one-to-ones because there was no parking so there was literally parking <laughs> for two cars. so two cars plus the people that lived there the elderly couple that lived there so there were their two cars plus my two cars which was literally chaos and so in total there were four cars and so I definitely couldn't do any groups we did hire a village hall. The village hall, we could have like four, five, six people there. And then we gradually moved to another village hall where we could have 10 people. So yeah, the village halls were another really good option. And then um, the other place were uh, was New Hall, which was a fantastic venue. I fell in love with New Hall. And I think New Hall, you could probably have like 30, 40 cars. Like it was really cool. Like it was a, it was a big space. And the name Devon Dogs, you say, is, is- 
is that something you just right away is stuck with hey, Devon think- dogs because you're in Devon and you're working with dogs I think if it were renaming, I would never call it something that relates to an area because it always made me think I can't ever leave. Like I can't ever, you feel a little bit like trapped to your area. However, I'm lucky that I do love Devon. I do wonder some days about sunshine. So uh, I was chatting <laughs> yesterday, she's Southern California and there's someone the day before and she's also Southern California. And I was like, you guys out of here, get out of here, all of you Californians. Um, <laughs> I do really love Devon and I love it slightly more in the summer than the winter. I won't lie. I'm not a massive winter fan. Uh, I love the summer. I'm I'm sunshine and waves, and that's what I love. <laughs> um, we're right next to beaches. We're beautifully coastal. We're gorgeously moorland. Like, it's a beautiful space. However, I would also say that, um, yeah, Devon Dogs is not the smartest move because you just can't ever move your business easily because it's linked to an area. Uh, and so uh, Devon Dogs, I love Devon, I love dogs. I like the DD element. I like alliteration in, in things. So that's, it was very easy. And speaking of names, the name Bowerland, where did that come from? So it was named, I actually have not looked and I probably should. Um, also, if people ask me directions to anywhere around here, I know nothing because I literally just rely on <laughs> So um, I'm terrible at like getting on with where I am and forgetting to like look into things I possibly should. But yeah, it's it's the whole the road the road is is Bowel and Cross. There is uh, about four properties down from us, and then our property is the first one that you come to. So we're the first property, and then the others go past and carry on going. Um, and we didn't name it, so they are already named. Uh, you can rename properties, actually. Uh, we've got a really lovely cottage. Uh, it's part of Bowerland Cottages, and it's called Parsley Cottage, and I love that name. And someone said, oh, would you change the name? And I was like, no, no, no. Like, I love the name Parsley Cottage. Bowerland, I'm not so attached to. I mean, I am the place, but not the name. But, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a location name. And okay. yeah, it's pretty. Parsley Cottage is a really pretty name. I love that name. I like it. So let's shift gears a little bit. It's a dog podcast. You have dogs. How many dogs do you have? Does Matt have his own dogs? Does Liza have her own dogs? Let's talk dogs. That would be telling. Uh, Dogs uh, wise, uh, we have enough dogs and I definitely (laughs) have a dog. And the biggest thing for me is uh, with our dogs is that uh, so Eliza definitely has her own dog. Eliza's dog is is Katie. Um, Matt has, I would say, a combination of dogs because we we see our dogs as our shared dogs. Really, my mum and dad kind of have um, Mango, and then Matt and I really share everybody else. Um, I think Everest was intended as Matt's and is really mine um, in terms of I compete with her and work with her. Um, easy Matt was going to run. Uh, I still work her and compete her. Uh, so yeah, we we definitely have enough dogs. And if if you ask Matt if I ask for another one, he'll say, "Oh dear Lord, like no more." Dogs. <laughs> um, but we do. We I mean we um, eat, sleep, breathe. Um, Matt and I get up first thing in the morning at about I don't know half past five, twenty to six, and and our day really is dogs from from half past five right through to half past 10 uh dogs are definitely our lives and they make our lives whole and they are our whole life so imagine you get up um early is all your day focused on your dogs how does that look because if you run a business you've got to be able to work absolute dogs barreland so is then is it Matt taking care of the dogs? Do you have other people really, working with your dogs? We're really lucky. We have a brilliant team. So I have trainers on site. They will work with me. They will work with students. They will work with my dogs. They will work with their dogs. They're fantastic. Um, so they definitely support. Um, Matt is amazing. So Matt's currently looking after dogs and Eliza while we're here. Um, and then I've also got, for example, um, things like um, general day to day, like walking, exercising. We've got an underwater treadmill. We've got a hydrotherapy pool here. We've also got team that work on those so they can do those. So my dogs are able to join in on any of the activities, depending on what we want and where we want it. So this evening, Everest, Venture and Classic have all been on the treadmill um, yesterday uh, between nine and three. Uh, I had my physio in and she just comes in and she has a list of dogs to work with and she'll just literally work through 
um she can do about she's about she does about a dog every 45 55 minutes depends on the dog and what they need so we're really lucky I think we're very good with having a team um I definitely um don't know where I'd be without a team when I'm away I tend to be able to leave my dogs at home mum and dad are at home and then I've got someone that will come in and support and help as well so with feeding or um whatever we're doing and for example when I'm away I'll fill a load of bones and I'll be like that's the size that blinks allowed that's the size <laughs> that allowed because realistically we we are away back and forth and then I want to come straight back and know they're ready to compete so I can't have them getting really heavy or really light they need to be pretty fit but we're very lucky the center is amazing and and this is the thing like every now and again you think like would you ever live anywhere else like everyone must think that would you ever live anywhere else would you ever do anything else and I look at this place and it is phenomenal we have the underwater treadmill we have the swimming pool we have the massive arena, we have a film studio, like the place is absolutely set out for dogs. It's an incredible space, the holiday cottages, the uh, students that can come here and stay and train, like everything is laid out really nicely for you. It's all very mapped out. It's, it's amazing. It's an incredible center. Uh, and so, yeah, the dogs are very lucky. That's, that's awesome. Do all of your dogs compete in some form or another? Really good question. Um, so no, they don't actually. And um, I think that, for example, um, Eliza's little dog, Katie, I've actively encouraged her not to, because I think that there's a lot that the competitive world brings. And also I do think for Eliza, focusing on the dog training and the dog in front of you without the pressure of people around you is quite important. And I also think that relationships, number one, and I don't think that relationship is ready for that pressure. And I think competition is a lot of pressure. Um, and then uh, the majority of, of my dogs do compete. And then obviously we've got Nifty. She's under, um, she's, she's, she's just about a year. She's too young, so she wouldn't be doing anything right now. And then mum um, and dad have Mango most of the time um, over, over at theirs. And she's definitely not a competition dog. She broke her leg as a young dog. So her dog would, her leg would never take the strain of that. Um, and so we wouldn't put her through it either. But I would say, yeah, the majority of our dogs compete. Um, obviously, when they get elderly, if they need to retire, don't tell Blink. She is just about nine years old. And at some point, there'll be retirement in her future. Um, she does not see it that way. Um, but yeah, the majority of our dogs do compete. And if we ever had to retire for any reason, I don't actually think my dogs would care if they competed or not. I think the biggest thing they love is they love to play, they love to work, they love to swim, um, but they don't actually care what it is. People get really hooked on my dog absolutely loves agility. And I'm like, they do like agility, but I do think they wouldn't care as long as they had your time. So speaking of agility, have you always done, or I guess maybe more important or more poignant question, when did you start agility? Have you done other dog sports, obedience, rally, shoots hound? Has it always been agility? What got you into agility? Yeah, so I've, I've been really lucky. Again, I've had a brilliant, um, I was going to try and show you a, a video, which I know obviously everyone will have to go onto YouTube again to find, but I'll see if I can find it. Um, I've, I've, I've had a really well-rounded um, dog um, like life, really. I, I've got... Um, things like uh, brave doing doing heel work on here and training a sort of really nice sort of obedience level sort of like like lovely 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 movement and trotting and heel work that was brave before her accident I've played um I've played at Schutzend um and uh, a level of I suppose um yeah bite work but not necessarily ever seriously more um more uh his brave doing you can get some bark on so brave doing some and then that's cool so that's cool so, and so for those listening go to youtube.com slash absolute dogs official check out this video because you'll be able to see the videos that's lauren showing and, this yeah, is more interactive <laughs> That's awesome. And that's brave again. <laughs> um, that's awesome. So yeah, there's, there's, I, I played at things like that. And then we've also done, that's I cool. mean, lots of gun dog training yeah. and, and playing around with covering the eyes. Can she find it? Um, so we've, we've had, that's we've cool. had a joyful upbringing in dog training and um, gun dog, um, obedience, 
uh, bike work. Um, he works music. I think I've, at Flyball, I have never played at Rally, but I definitely know that it's another game. And I know that games work. So I'm, I'm pleased that people yeah. play games. I've always been involved in agility since I can remember. Probably started it when I was about 17. So for me, a long time. And I started jumping dogs when I was like nine. Like whenever I could make a dog jump, I wanted to make a dog jump. I made my hamster jump. I had pet rats. They jumped. I literally made every animal I could find. <laughs> like I like making animals jump. I've always liked making animals jump. It's in my blood. It's in my bones to want to make animals jump. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. That's a unique skill. <laughs> Jumping animals. That's awesome. I don't know where it's come from. I just love making animals uh, make beautiful movements over shape. And I suppose helping and encouraging and, and conditioning That's it. That's fun. I I think it's really cool that what I'm hearing, hopefully, and I imagine people listening are going to get things out of it themselves, but it, everybody has their certain likes and dislikes, even as you're talking, teaching school, like you like certain things, you didn't like certain things. And I think the big key in success is finding what you like and really kind of honing that. Like you love animals jumping. Like that's a very unique subset of and training. The funny thing is, if you, I can imagine, I've never asked them, but people I went to school with or the guys I went to uni with, like I, I am not the best at keeping in touch and I'm not the best at, I'm just not. But I bet if you asked any of my friends from when I was back at school or any of the people I went to university with, I bet all of these tendencies were there. I bet they would have spotted them. I bet they would have known them. I bet they could have almost written this. And I bet when they see Facebook videos and, and stuff like this, they'd be like, yeah, she was always, uh, that was always her. <laughs> and I, so for me, whenever I hear stuff, listen to stuff, I'm always trying to add practical, make it practical. So this, people listening, this isn't just a story about Lauren. It's, for me, it's like, how, how can we relate this to you listening, hopefully you watching? Uh, what I'm hearing is find out what lights you up. Is it making dogs jump? Is it making dogs lay down? Is it something totally different? What lights you up? How can you put your mark on that? Is it something totally different? Is it something that everybody's doing, but you do it different? Is it something that nobody's doing, but you can do it different? What is that? Start asking different questions. I know I've mentioned it before in previous podcasts about our dogs. Ask different questions. You get different answers. Do that with yourself. Ask different questions. Maybe ask your friends. Lauren just mentioned it um, in talking. Oh, I'm sure her friends would recognize this. Stuff. So maybe talk to your family. Talk to your friends. What do you see that I'm doing with dogs? Figure out what that niche is. Whether you want to do this as a job or whether you just have fun. You're listening to this podcast because you like dogs to some degree. What can you do more with it? Figure out where is your mark? What is your special? It might not be opening up Amazing Center like Lauren has. It might not be in a pro dog trainer like me. It could be something just specific with your dog. Is it teaching your dog how to jump? Is it teaching your dog how to lay down? Is it teaching your dog to be a nice dog? Figure that out. And I, I, that's what I, I'm hearing Lauren talk. And I hear practical application for me. So I don't want to miss that and just breeze over that for those that are listening. Make this real. This is not just Lauren's story. Yes, we're talking Lauren. Um, mine would probably be similar, but different. But find your niche. What is it that your lights you up what is it and make that yours run with it um is it agility is it is it rally is it like again is it just having a well-behaved dog and other people are like dang you got a well-behaved dog and i don't know it, it's a very personal intimate question so um, i encourage you as as you listen to this podcast what lights you up is it something that lauren said that's like oh I want to try that. Is it something that I've said that's like, oh, that's cool? I don't know. And it's very personal to you. So as you're listening to this, make it yours. Um, kind of transition to that, that talking Lauren has this amazing center, amazing uh, facility and, and job. Um, it's you and Tom. How did, how did Absolute Dogs really 
come about? Because we, we talked about you going from law to teaching to dog teaching and Devon dogs kind of springing from that. Was Tom always a part of it? You guys are like brother, sister. So did you guys grow up together? And did you guys just develop this absolute dogs? How did absolute dogs come about? Yeah, I literally did not meet Tom until the day he came here for training. So he came here for training. He brought his dog Illy along to a new environment to train here. And um, he must have um, booked via Devon Dogs, heard of Devon Dogs because it was possibly local. And Tom at the time lived in Bristol, I think. And um, he was was still studying and he brought his black poodle down here and she did really well. She was a lovely, lovely dog in the group. And I remember just thinking how funny it would be because there was so much good energy and there was so much fun to be had. And I was like, you know what? The world needs to see this. The world needs this amount of fun. Like I I remember shouting it out and like being like, Tom, we should do this. Like we should do this. This would be incredible. Like We must do this. And that was it really. I said to Matt, Matt, there's this guy I met at training. Matt must have been like, okay. One thing I'd say with Matt is he's, he's always been great about stuff like that. He's never like the jealous or the, the odd type with that. He's just really cool. He's really cool. He's like, okay, tell me more. I'm like, honestly, Matt, you'd love him. Like, he's brilliant. And he was like, okay, tell me more. And I was like, we need to do, cameras. We need to do this thing. I don't know what it's going to be. And anyway, we didn't really know what it was. We just met up a few times and kept chatting on it. And then... I was in Bermuda, I was teaching, which sounds crazy, but I was teaching. And I took Matt with me and Matt was teaching too. Um, and Matt was teaching on dress and I was teaching because I loved it. Matt was teaching because I told him he needed to. <laughs> and while we were out there, I said, what, what would it take to get us to like, put something like together? I want to do some sort of like academy type thing. I didn't call it academy, but I wanted an academy. And we bought some paper, we bought some pens, and then I bought Matt a lot of beer. <laughs> and I made him sign on the dotted line that by a certain day we could have this course up and running. And if not, then he'd broken his contract with me. And so I literally plowed him with so much beer that by the end of it, he'd agreed to do this academy. And the academy was born initially because I think what I knew best was agility. And Tom and I didn't really know which direction we were going in. It was largely agility and sports-based. So is this the academy, was this just you and Matt? Or was this you, Matt, and no, Tom? Me, Matt, and Tom. But I had to get Matt to kind of agree because okay. he was the guy that would film it, edit it, make it all happen, and do all the tech to make it all happen. And I knew that Tom and I probably wouldn't. And so I knew I certainly wouldn't. And, and Tom and Matt are both really brilliantly techie. Like they're both great at being techie. And so off we went, we created the training academy. We've never looked back. The training academy is an amazing space. It's for sure had revamps. It's for sure had like different ways of thinking it. But yeah, we started the training academy. How long ago was that? That's got to be, I mean, I'd have to look, but it's got to be coming up for 10 years. Okay. Wow. We need to do like a 10 year celebration or something. I'm not sure if it's 23 or 24, but it's definitely coming mm-hmm. up for 10 years. So that is that's cool. Bit tower. Let's do it. So that's, so you met Tom. He get, Again, what I'm hearing is that good things happen when you're a trainer. So I, I can, I could possibly meet my significant other. And I could meet a partner for business. This, I'm liking this. Okay, this is this is good. Uh, so you met Tom, and immediately, it sounds like you guys were buddies right from the start. That I mean, like, I feel like I've always known Tom. I feel like that's cool. we have had a lot of fun, um, and I feel like it's a really, it's a really cool space to work in. Like, it's very. It's very creative. It's a very creative space to work in. It's a nice space to work in. That's cool. It comes across in your content. Um, it comes across with absolute dogs. It just exudes that fun, that creativity. And that obviously comes from you and Tom and that that dynamic with you guys. So that's, that's kind of fun to hear that um, you guys met and just kind of worked and that's cool. And, and then having the behind the scenes that I'm very much a kind of a guy. I know we, we talked a little before. I love 
kind of behind the scenes and knowing how things work. And that was kind of the idea with this podcast, behind the scenes of, of Lauren and get to know Lauren and just who and what she is and how this works. And, and leading up to Absolute Dogs, I would love to do one with Tom and get to know who is Tom and, and do a little more um, Absolute Dog stuff and that sort of thing. I, I love this. This is um, this has been fun for me and hopefully fun for those listening and and hopefully you're watching. I've dropped the YouTube queue enough. Hopefully youtube.com slash Absolute Dogs official. Time. You've done well at that time, for sure. So hopefully, um, is there what what is next? Do you even know what is next for for Lauren? I think that's a really cool thing, isn't it? I think more fun, more adventure. Since my dad's um, cancer diagnosis, I have definitely taken more time out for having fun and having adventures. Um, whether that be um, Matt and I are going on a safari really soon, um, or a mini one. <laughs> Um, and uh, we've got some adventures in like Thailand and, and other places. And, and I really think more adventure, more fun. Like when we get time, we spend like weeks away with Eliza and go horse riding or um, looking at history or looking in like, I know we've recently been, I said already like Northern Ireland and looking in the jails and the history of Belfast and like really trying hard to enjoy more experiences. Like we, we need less stuff. We need more experiences. We need less physical. We need more memory. Like I, I genuinely believe mm -hmm. that the world can quickly get very materialistic. And I believe number one for, for all of us should be um, amazing connection and memories, like making, making connections. Awesome. I guess one final question. Um, so knowing us will probably lead to 10 more questions. Um, when you started back in, uh, I guess, leaving teaching and you started in your field on a hill, did you ever imagine that you would be kind of literally reaching around the world with your impact and that what you were doing would do what it is now? I never saw this coming at the level that it's yeah. at. I never like strategically plan this or map this out. Like all I did was enjoyed what I was doing and had a lot of fun, took opportunities, enjoyed the people I taught, listened to what they said and, and took on board advice and surrounded myself with really great people. And the more that I've done that and the more that I've, I've said yes to the things I really enjoy and I said no to the people to be honest, I don't. And I think it's it's taken us a heck of a long way. Not being too easily offended, not being like trying not to have a chip on your shoulder, uh, trying to be humble, grateful, um, open, like I said, to opportunity and open minded, not judgy. And most of all, ready for whatever might come, ready to pivot. I think pivot is the word since um for us, Absolute Dogs changed gears during COVID and we were so ready to pivot. And I think being ready to pivot is the single most useful thing that I can share. I, I never saw this coming and yet I was always ready for it. That's cool. That's cool. We were chatting, texting the other day and you were talking to me about pivoting and it's it's working. Um, it's, it's kind of fun. You get in sometimes stuck in a groove right whatever um and it's thinking differently ask different questions you get different answers i don't care what subject you're talking about um well i gotta say this has been an absolute blast for me and i hopefully for you and you listening i hope you've gotten to know lauren just a little bit better the heart and soul of absolute dogs uh this is this has truly been fun. Uh, Lauren, thank you so much for allowing me to, to be a part of this, to kind of sit down and have a chat with you. Thank you for um, letting me into your house via Zoom. Um, this, is, this has absolutely been a blast. Um, yeah, hopefully we can continue and do more. And yeah, I like this. Um, yeah. It's been fun. It's been so fun. Now, Obviously, that was this episode of the podcast. Thank you, Tower, Lowe's, for uh, having me. Uh, I feel really, uh, that was a great pleasure. I'm just going to outro with, and remember. Stay sexy. 
Hey, before you go, have you taken part in the worldwide Sexier Than a Squirrel Challenge? It's a 25-day online video program, huge energy, amazing community, and over 100,000 people are already taking part. The only question is, you know where you are today. Where do you want to be in 25 days from now? Head to absolutedogs.me forward slash sexy.